For several months, I've been working on something a bit unlike anything I've ever done before. I've been painstakingly reconstructing a member of one of the weirdest, most specialized, poorly understood, and often inaccurately depicted groups of animals in the fossil record. And it's finally complete. I'm excited to announce that I've been working with the National Aviary in Pittsburgh to create my very first life-sized paleoart sculpture, a pterosaur called Kaiwajara. This sculpture was created and recently installed for their new exhibit called Living Dinosaurs, which explores the connection between birds and their prehistoric relatives. The focus of the exhibit is on eggs and babies and explores the numerous parallels in reproduction and parenting behavior shared between birds and their nearest relatives, the non-avian dinosaurs. Now, Kaiwajara is not a dinosaur. It's a pterosaur. And although pterosaurs were flying around with wings, they are only really distantly related to modern birds and the non-bird dinosaurs that birds evolved from. But dinosaurs and pterosaurs, and even crocodilians, all share a common ancestor, way, way back in the Triassic period, somewhere around 240 million years ago. This huge, diverse group that includes dinosaurs and pterosaurs and everything related to crocodilians are all referred to as archosaurs. Pterosaurs are really interesting among the archosaurs because they're the first vertebrates to evolve powered flight. Their fossils indicate that many of the traits we associate with birds, such as egg laying in nests and complex parenting behavior, and perhaps even early plumage, go all the way back to the base of the archosaur family tree. Only recently have fossils shown us that many of these traits were common to dinosaurs as well, and have thus clearly established the connection between theropod dinosaurs and modern birds. The aviary houses an astonishing diversity of living dinosaurs, with all kinds of fantastic adaptations, many of which they share in common with pterosaurs, such as hollow bones, plumage insulating their bodies. Many pterosaurs, like birds, had beaks, and many had bizarre and elaborate head crests. Many of these living dinosaurs you can encounter at the aviary in naturalistic free-flight habitats. And if you move slowly or sit still, very often they'll approach you, stare you down, and make really weird noises. But the aviary doesn't just have birds. They have a few other animals too, including a group of flying foxes. These large bats demonstrate to guests one of the other ways vertebrates have evolved the ability to fly. And so the inclusion of a pterosaur model in the atrium of the aviary creates an opportunity for aviary staff to educate the public about the three different ways vertebrates convergently evolved the ability to fly. Now, Kayuajara is really interesting because it's from a group of pterosaurs called the Tapajarids, which had some of the biggest and most ridiculous headcrests in the history of living things. Pterosaur expert and paleontologist Dr. Dave Hone explained to me that if the crest served an important aerodynamic function and was necessary for maneuvering or flying, then we would expect a lot of pterosaurs to evolve similarly sized and shaped crests to accomplish that mechanical feat. But because pterosaur crests come in a wild variety of shapes and sizes, that suggests their main function was actually social and sexual display. So in working with the National Aviary staff, we thought this animal with a showy display crest would make an eye-catching addition to the exhibit space, while also drawing visitors' attention to some of the amazing living denizens of the aviary, many of which also have awesome headgear for social and sexual display. One of the other fascinating things about Kayuajara is that unlike many pterosaurs, which are only known from a few fossils, it is known from hundreds of fossils, from dozens of specimens of various ages. 
Because most of the fossils have come from juveniles, all found together, the bone beds Kaiwajara were found in have been interpreted as nesting sites or rookeries where young Kaiwajara were growing up before they were suddenly buried by a flash flood. While visiting the National Aviary to install the sculpture, I was struck by how perfect it is to exhibit dinosaur fossils in this context at the aviary. And the design of the exhibits beautifully takes that into account. Because at the National Aviary, the concept of extinction isn't just an abstract idea that affected some far off animals in deep time. It's something they're working tirelessly against every day. These are our Edwards pheasants, and we have tried to make a very natural habitat for them. They're native to the forests of Vietnam, and the reason it's so important to have them in human care in institutions such as the National Aviary is because the habitat we have here is the only thing left for them. In Vietnam, um, the forests have been clear-cut for monocultures of palm oil, so there's really a challenge for these species in the wild because of deforestation. So we've tried to replicate their natural habitat here and with the hopes that we can have a uh, growing population in human care and then eventually reintroduce if the forests become stable. We know for a fact that they are comfortable in this habitat. They arrived to us just about six months ago in the summer and they have already successfully reproduced, which is pretty amazing. One of the most spectacular real fossils on display at the National Aviary is an amazingly well-preserved oviraptorid dinosaur nest from Mongolia and the aviary has put it in a display right next to the window into the aviary vet lab where you can see their Edwards pheasant chick. We're particularly excited about this species, the Edwards pheasant, because they are um, thought to be extinct in their native range. So there has not been a recorded sighting of the Edwards pheasants in the forests of Vietnam, where they're native, since 2000. And there's less than a thousand of them in human care around the world. So we are just ecstatic that they felt comfortable enough to reproduce here at the National Aviary. I think this little floof of a living dinosaur next to this huge nest of its ancient relatives is a perfect and poignant reminder that prehistoric animals and modern ones are all part of a continuum of life, engaged in the same timeless struggle to survive on our living planet. And that continuum of life includes us. And our daily actions have a direct effect on the history of life and death on our planet. There are a few things that people can do to help um, this species and other species that live in rainforests around the world. Uh, specifically, you can download an app um, from the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo or other apps that tell you how to avoid um, products that have palm oil that's been harvested from in unsustainable ways. So if you download the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo's palm oil app, that'll give you a good guide of what you're buying in the grocery store it is something that's actually helping species. If you're near the northeastern United States, I hope you'll make the migration over to the National Aviary in Pittsburgh to explore the amazing naturalistic habitats inhabited by living dinosaurs and wonder at the fossils of their ancient relatives displayed right alongside them, along with some really great pieces of paleo art by a number of great artists, including Louis Ray, Gary Stab, and others. Needless to say, I am super excited to be a part of this exhibit and to have my Cayuajara sculpture in such good company. And I owe a huge thanks to the National Aviary staff who made this project happen, especially Jennifer Torpy, Cheryl Tracy, Tricia O'Neill, Carly Morgan, and Robin Weber. Also a big shout out to Alana Register at Silver Plume Exhibitions for the amazing work on the rest of the Living Dinosaurs exhibit. I'm also indebted to the paleontologists who advised on this tricky reconstruction, especially Dr. David Hone and Dr. Michael Habib, who really explained a lot of the nitty-gritty details of pterosaur anatomy and aerodynamics when creating this sculpture. And finally, a big ups to paleontologist Paolo Manzig and his co-authors for making the paper describing the Cayuajara bone beds open access. A link to that paper so that you can read the science for yourself is in the description of this video. This video was made possible by my supporters on Patreon. To support my art directly and make other videos about the science and technique of creating paleo art and other projects, 
I hope you'll consider making a small monthly pledge on patreon.com slash historian himself, which will also get you access to a bunch of behind the scenes material, including the making of this pterosaur sculpture. As always, to see more of my art, music, and filmmaking, visit my website, don'tmesswithdinosaurs.com. Thanks for watching.